Welcome everyone to this event on the Library of the Great Silence um, here at the Alice and Richard Building. My name is Judith Weick and I am the Communications Manager at CRASH and I'm also an artist and I coordinate the exhibitions program at the Alice and Richard Building. For the purposes of this exhibition, I'm an assistant librarian for the Cambridge branch of the Library of the Great Silence. I would now like to introduce you to the, um, my fellow librarians of this project. Um, so, acclaimed as poet of ideas by The New Yorker, Jonathan Keats is an artist, writer and experimental philosopher based in the United States and Europe. His concept conceptually driven transdisciplinary projects explore all aspects of society, adapting methods from the sciences and, and the humanities. He's the author of six books on subjects ranging from science and technology to art and design. In addition to several fellowships, he is currently an artist in residence at Hyundai and the SETI Institute. Jonathan founded the Library of the Great Silence in 2021 and currently serves as chief terrestrial librarian. Robert Good is an artist based in Cambridge. He's interested in words, text and language and the, and the impact of technology on our lives. He's currently developing a cybernetic meadow, a large scale digital installation. Last year, he received a research grant from Arts Council England to visit Silicon Valley and go in search of the internet, where he met Jonathan and first heard about the library. Robert is creating a podcast in relation to the Library of the Great Silence and some of the objects in it. More about that later in this talk. Before we begin the discussion, I will show you a few images of the Cambridge branch of the library. Here you can see where the exhibition is located in the Alison Richard building. And in the photo of the right, you can see a box of library index cards where visitors can nominate or suggest objects of their own for the library. You can also submit objects for a Twitter collection via the hashtag library of great silence. Here are some objects arranged on the plinths. These have been collected by the assistant librarians from members of the public and from some museums in, in Cambridge. Yeah, thank, well, thank you, Judith. I'll, I'll, um, I'll kick off if I, if, you, if I will, and I'll, I'll introduce Jonathan and, and this part of the, the, the session. What I wanted to do was to have the chance to uh, say welcome to Cambridge, Jonathan, um, remotely at least, and to this conversation that we wanted to have about the project. And I thought maybe we'd do it in two halves. First of all, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the contents in that film and, and the ideas behind the extraterrestrial dimension to this project. And then after that, maybe we can focus on some of the objects that uh, have been uh, offered to the, to the project and um, we can uh, have a little bit of a chat around that. And then finally, we will open it up for, for comments and suggestions um, from, from everybody who's here. So I hope that works for people. Could you maybe just recap some of the ideas? I don't think everybody who might have come into contact with our library thus far is totally up to speed with the extraterrestrial dimension to this. And you are the chief terrestrial officer. Maybe you could summarise what that entails and how the library is um, addressing this concept of the great silence for us, please. So the, the origin story, so to speak, is back in 1950, Enrico Fermi, a Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize winning physicist, was having lunch with colleagues and they were talking about how the universe must be teeming with extraterrestrial intelligence. And Fermi famously asked, well, where is everybody? And this became known as the great silence. That is to say, this mystery that you would think we wouldn't be alone based on the fact that Copernicus told us there's nothing special about us. And yet here we are, we've never come across any little green men. So many explanations have been advanced. And one of them of course is that we are alone. Maybe that's true, but another that really has haunted me personally and motivated me to create the Library of the Great Silence is what's known as the Great Filter, which is a hypothesis that when a civilization reaches a level of complexity that it might become apparent to others elsewhere in the universe, that there tends to be something self-annihilating in terms of how that complexity plays out. That, in other words, 
a situation such as the situation that we found ourselves in when this was first proposed in the 1970s, where nuclear apocalypse was seemingly on the horizon, and especially now where, well, nuclear apocalypse still seems like it may be on the horizon, and also where we are looking at climate change and mass extinction and many other existential factors. It seems that looking at ourselves, there may be real plausibility to that claim. And so that led me to think about how we really need to be thinking about complexity and thinking about civilization and how we have constructed the civilization in which we live. And perhaps that the little green men or other extraterrestrials might find themselves in a similar situation. So the idea was to create a reference library open to all beings throughout the universe, where we would have transformational objects that would be available for, for purposes of trying to figure out how we got to where we are and where we might be going and how best to contend with the challenges that come with complexity. And the reason that I chose objects rather than books was because I didn't know whether the little green men would necessarily know English or whether in fact they would read books in the first place, whether language as we know it would be appropriate. So I decided that it would make more sense to really work instead with, with things in their own right. And these range from a paleolithic hand axe to, to microplastics, a whole gamut of, for us on earth, indicators of and objects that are implicated in the the people we have become that this then becomes an open space for inquiry through their uh, through their nomination through their arrangement through their juxtaposition that was really the founding principle of the library and while there have not been any little green men at least not so far i think that there's been something really useful in the decision not to work in English or with books, but rather than with objects, which is that it makes a library open to all of us here on earth in a way that it levels the requirements for being engaged in this process, and also that it leaves out a lot of the assumptions that are embedded in our languages that we may not even know. Fantastic. And I, I, what I liked was at the end of the, the, the film, um, that the final, the closing clip is, is you setting up this little post box sized object containing these objects to welcome the little green men when they finally arrive on Earth. Never mind the great big array of telescopes right next door for them to look at. They're going to go to your little library, open the cupboard and find a tin of anchovies. And I, <laughs> and I thought to myself, hmm, so, so, so what's that gonna, how are they gonna, how, how, how might these, these extraterrestrials engage with it? Or what, what might they think about? Or what might they um, uh, come to uh, conclude from, from that little box of tricks that you've put out for them? Well, the location is the Allen Telescope Array, which is the largest telescope array that is searching the universe for extraterrestrial intelligence. It is it, it is maintained by the SETI Institute, where I am currently an artist in residence. And to me, it not only is the place where we are most likely to have contact, if in fact there are uh, intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe, and I don't know any more than anyone else does here on Earth. Uh, but given the sheer effort with those telescopes, it seems that that would be the place where contact would be most likely. But I think also it would be the ultimate tourist attraction if anybody were to come here. So while those telescopes are engaged in listening for radio signals, if there were to be any sort of visitation, I would think that they would want to go where we've shown the most curiosity. And so then to engage them in dialogue, I decided that it would make sense because after a while, the telescopes probably become less interesting. They're going to want to engage more deeply. So I, I purchased a little free library. I, I think that in the UK, you have something equivalent to these. They're basically 
community libraries on street corners that people can leave a book or take a book. And I wanted a similar sort of dynamic for terrestrials as well, for anybody to engage in this process of, of, of deciding what ultimately can define us. Not that it definitively that it does define us, but that it could be a starting point for us being able to look at ourselves from, from outside of the system that we have built, at least to some, some extent, by looking at the objects in a way that that, that 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 makes them alien to us, that we can look at those objects at least with the idea that the little green men and women may be looking over our shoulder, that we may be looking at those objects with them. There also is within that box a set of chambers that are also the chambers that we have in the Cambridge branch, which are basically a Venn diagram but where the Venn diagram is three-dimensional and allows for the juxtaposition of objects in a way that can, that can lead to the discovery and elucidation of concepts, where objects that perhaps on the surface seem unrelated, but that are clearly really deeply implicated in who and what we are, so that tin of anchovies, for instance, well, canned food has really, and the preservation of food really has defined us in so many ways and allowed us to do so much of what we've been able to, both for better and for worse, I would argue. The, these objects can be juxtaposed with each other methodically, and that by taking the inner chambers, we can, we can elucidate concepts. We can define these new concepts potentially that we didn't have words for, where it gets really complicated and interesting, where we're not just dealing with how two objects might have something in common, but where three objects, each of each pair of which has something in common, clearly have something in common. And there I've found we often don't have the language, at least not in English. And these tokens become a way in which to be able to carry the language forward. Well, maybe in a minute we'll come on to some of the objects themselves and have a conversation about about the, the, the their juxtaposition and how they might interrelate, and and also some of the objects that um, people have donated uh, or or loaned us for the, for the collection. So definitely, I want to come come back to you on that. I thought I'd close out this little portion of the the conversation around the extraterrestrial dimension by saying that. So I'm doing. A little podcast. I'm going round Cambridge and I'm having a, a conversation with some of the people who've suggested objects for me. And I don't know whether it's by chance or, or whether it was arranged by the little green men and, as you say, women, um, a, a, um, whether it was uh, just serendipity. But one of the one of the people that I had a chat with, Emily Mitchell, she's been um, her speciality is to uh, look at fossils 500 million years old and see if we can work out uh, how they lived, what that can tell us about early life forms. But amazingly, that same technolo technology that she's using, um, she reckons that maybe within the next 20 years or so might help us to discover uh, uh, signs of life on, on other, other exoplanets elsewhere in in the near galaxy so it seems to come full circle she wasn't quite sure if it was going to be intelligent life that's the only downside to my little story there but that sense of us being whether we're alone in the universe or whether we're uh, connected to other people she thinks maybe there's quite a reasonable chance that there may be other kind of microbial or very um, primitive life and that would be um, a, a signature in the atmosphere on these exoplanets and I so think, think, maybe there's there's life that's closer than we think but I think that is essential that we be agnostic in terms of how we define intelligence or at least that we be more open than thinking of intelligence as being our own a quality that is uniquely human or perhaps only one that belongs to primates I think that 
we see in bacterial colonies extraordinary intelligence in quorum sensing, for instance, and that probably microbial life as found by astrobiologists elsewhere in the universe will manifest other forms of intelligence that can be equally extraordinary, that can really challenge us in profound ways. But I, I would also say that the inclusion of what we might call natural objects or materials, fossils, is actually, I think, a really important part of what the library is and what we're doing, because the library is really involved in the collection of technologies that have been transformative. But I think that we tend to define trans technologies in terms of ourselves exclusively, when in fact, to me, technologies also are to be found in terms of the evolutionary inventions of all other life forms. Photosynthesis, quite frankly, is a far more profound technology in terms of how it's altered the planet than anything that humans have ever come up with. So I think that we really need to include those and to include the, the inventors of those technologies in the dialogue if we are to understand how we got to be where we are and where we might go, who we might become going forward. Well, I and, I, and I know that you're quite a champion of the of the rights of 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 the the inventors of these other technologies like photosynthesis and so on, and that plants have 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 developed all of these amazing mechanisms that we're now freeloading on, and maybe we should give some of those rights back to them or rebalance things, and that's actually a a serious way in which we can rebalance our ecological debt by acknowledging their. Uh, primacy in developing some of these amazing tele technologies that we're now lifting and 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 repurposing. Well, maybe we should come on to some of the uh, examples of uh, some of the objects that we've got in the collection. And maybe, Judith, maybe what I'll try and have a go at is I can share the screen, and I've just got a list of I've got just got some of the images that are in the in the collection, so we can maybe talk about some of them, or maybe some of them we can share them with everybody. And let's just have a look. Um, so if if that if that if any of those uh, spring to mind or we particularly want to talk about some of them, then we can. Um, oops, let me just. Um, so I'm going to go back to because amazingly that in one I was talking to Judith about this before. You put a tin of anchovies in your very first uh, free library at the. Uh, um, SETI Institute at the Array of Telescopes. And, and by total coincidence, or again, it may be kind of extraterrestrial influence here. We, we've got a tin of anchovies in here that, that uh, Judith placed quite by chance. Is that a totally chance event, would you say, um, Jonathan? Or do you think uh, there's something more to that? Well, looking at the objects that have been selected by you and Judith, and I'm really grateful to you and fascinated by what you selected because this ultimately is a project that needs to manifest in different ways in different places according to different ways of thinking that different people might have. I'm really fascinated by the convergences, not only the tin of anchovies, which admittedly in, in my case are sardines, but nevertheless, not so far apart on the phylogenetic tree. I also, thought it was anchovies. Oh, I'll go back and have a look. Anyway, I, I, I believe that yours are, no, I believe yours are anchovies. No, and but mine I thought yours anchovies. were as well. I That's have, you're right. They may be anchovies in that micro branch. In the case of the full scale branch, I believe that I had sardines. So okay, right. I've been a little bit um, fast and loose. I've been open, fast and loose with the fish. Yes. But also I have an abacus that was in the San Francisco branch. There was a candle. I mean, I'm just looking right now at the objects that, that are on that particular plinth. I, I think that when we start to think about ourselves in these terms, namely when we start to excavate our own past, I think that it's really interesting to find that while the form factors are quite different and the difference between sardines and anchovies is 
a good example of this, where really, while the fish are entirely different from the fish's perspective, perspective it's a world apart from, from the perspective of what we're trying to instantiate or to express that we get to this concept of canning or of food preservation by way of having these two examples. And likewise, by having the two different abacuses or having the abacus and the calculator, we get to comp calculation and computation conceptually. And where it gets even more interesting, I think, is because I also had a calculator in the branch that I opened in San Francisco. And I believe that we had one also in the branch that we opened in at the Deutsche Museum in Munich, that there are ways in which these objects align in different, in different geometries, so to speak, based on the questions that we are asking or the questions that we're led to ask as a result of recognizing affinities. So that the calculator and the abacus have a lot in common in terms of both being objects of calculation, but perhaps the abacus and the coin have more in common in terms of their relationship to commerce. And so I think that the ways in which these slippages play out, that this becomes generative. And I was fascinated earlier today to learn about how you and Judith decided to place objects on the plinths where you didn't really have any plan at the outset. I didn't either when I first installed a branch here in San Francisco and where they ultimately, for aesthetic reasons, come to work together visually in a way that engages people, but where those visual engagements actually are generative in the sense that because it is pseudo-random at a conceptual level, it scrambles our taxonomies. It scrambles the ways in which we conceptually tend to organize things such that perhaps seeing the coin next to the calculator where they were put next to each other for reasons to do with what looked good in the case maybe leads to a conversation that would otherwise not have taken place. Yes, certainly we we did we did put them together as you say well um, it, it, with a kind of aesthetic in, we we were carefully arranging them there, there was a kind of sense it's a bit like when you hang pictures in an exhibition you know this goes with that and you can't always say exactly why but you just kind of know or you feel that that's the right way for things to do maybe people are looking at these images and thinking oh I wouldn't put them that way I'd I'd change it all around and of course it is subjective. But nevertheless, it was around those types of judgments that we put the put, put the, the, the the groups together. And I certainly also found that there were progressions in terms of some of the technology. You talked about the abacus to the calculator, and certainly um, also with my podcast conversations, the we've been talking about particular objects. But it becomes very clear that any one object, which is taken as a as an example of a a, a transformative object is only one small point on a on a continuation on a continuing evolution of ideas. I mean, the camera, for example, there, you know, it didn't stop there. We had the earlier, more the box camera, um, which which predated that, and then next to that, we've got the the camera on the smartphone. And so there was definitely a sense in which, well. Every, most things are transformational. Some of them are kind of the, the, the foundational object of transformation, and then some of them are iterations or, or, or developments on them. But the other thing that I wanted to say, or, or that came out of some of the conversations that we had were around the, the, the subject of language and, and, and talking about these objects, because I found that we, you know, Although we want to exclude language from this library, obviously we were unable to um, talk about them without using language. And we kind of fell back onto 
the the same i felt that we were falling back onto the same ways of thinking about objects so the idea that this library provides us with catalysts for new thought i don't think I quite cracked that in terms of how I could make those connections or how that might create new thought processes. And going back to that whole thing about existential risk and trying to turn the ship around, how do you think some of these objects placed together might, what are the expectations around how that might help us to, to think differently? Well, the irony of course is that we're using words and that's by necessity, given the format of this conversation. The library has really been meant to be situated in a place at a time that brings beings together in terms of interaction with the object, where language as we know it may be used, but where it is secondary. And in my experience, it really has been in the back and forth of moving objects around in space that the ideas that are most profound have come, have, have, have surfaced and not necessarily in ways that have allowed for expression in language as we currently construe it, but rather in a common understanding that comes about through that interaction. And so another part of what you and Judith did in terms of how you laid out these objects was through a, a sort of a dialogue that entailed each one of you selecting objects in response to objects that others had that, that the other had placed on on the plinth. And I think that that starts to get at the kind of dynamic that I'm suggesting becomes possible in this sort of space. And I certainly wouldn't want to front load or to overdetermine or to predetermine the discoveries to be made in a space as a result of the interaction with the objects. So I wouldn't want to try to explain away what is at some level a, a mystery that is not resolvable in any way that no longer operates on us, that no longer acts upon us in, in the mystery that is underlying whatever resolution we might have from moment to moment. I wouldn't want to, to remove that mystery, but I would say that for those who are not in the room, and I'm not, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco quite far away, I think that even in the imagination it becomes possible to, to accept the fact that, or to object for that matter, but I would accept that the seashells and the camera and the and the smartphone that these are all objects that i know have changed the world in ways that the world in which we live is the result of the impact they have had they've had over time and so Therefore, in my mind, it really becomes a matter of trying to find the through lines. So there is a through line, as you've suggested, where we can look at the camera next to the smartphone. But I am absolutely convinced that we can find through lines in any case whatsoever, because all of these objects coexist in the world, manifesting at different times in history, there is therefore in the world as a whole, some way in which they relate. And I think that it's up to us to address that challenge, accepting that there is some level of that at which it is a mystery, namely that we were not there and the wonder that comes with that mystery. 
but I think that we can at the same time really take this in the most rigorous way possible of trying to trying to imagine possible through lines and then to to take them forward beyond what we're seeing in the room to what might be. When we think about innovation, we tend to think about it as the recombination of past inventions in relation to new problems. And in a way, the Library of the Great Silence is also a laboratory. It's a laboratory in which we can look forward and imagine new possibilities in relation to the problems that we now face based on how problems in the past were addressed through technologies invented by humans or by others. So that process of, of invention is certainly something that can take place in the library. But I think that then there's a step back that I'm really urging, which is to say, as we do this, and as we start to open up and to fill the possibility space of what might be with all these marvelous new inventions that we can come up with by being in this space with these objects that are extraordinary in terms of what they what they've done in the past that we also take the multiplicity of possibilities in that possibility space to be able to consider both retrospectively what got us to whatever it is that we're imagining and what might be the hidden or the the hidden assumptions or the unforeseen consequences, but also how do we fill that space sufficiently then to be able to, of all the possible futures, to be able to really explore and to collectively decide which of those futures is desirable? What do we really want? So that I think is something that can happen in the imagination of any individual who comes upon these objects, but also I think more powerfully comes about through the interaction between individuals who share this world. And in the case of the little green men and, and women who share this universe, that there is something really powerful there and also something that is really important because we need to take responsibility for our actions. And we need to recognize that these are decisions that we have made and that Technologies are not inevitable in terms of our acceptance of them, but rather that what we do is intentional and that the intentionality needs to be examined in a way that is outside of the process of invention or innovation in its own right. Right. Well, um, <laughs> I'm only smiling because I, I know we've talked about this before in terms of uh, speaking in sound bites. And I know that for you is a sound bite. So, <laughs> but that's, that's no, I mean, it is fascinating. And, and one of the one of the conclusions or tentative conclusions that I'm coming towards in, in having these conversations and thinking about the library, of, maybe this is not superficial, but maybe this kind of runs counter to to what you were saying about using this as a means of, of, of finding new connections or hidden connections or unexpected correlations. I mean, I found myself not, not trying to be too scientific or too clear cut, but some of the, the objects did fall into different flavors of transformation. And I found myself finding, for example, there were some that were, that were primarily, I put in the practical bucket so uh, the hand axe, the 100,000 year old hand axe, which you can see on, on the bottom right here would, would be something that's very practical, a practical uh, transformative object that kind of enabled us to do things practically. There were others that were much more personal and well, maybe the bottle of wine is, is one example where you, know, you have that per personal transformation after a glass of wine or two, uh, that's a kind of, um something to do with your your mindset that is that is transformed by the object and in that category some not all of them are part of the uh library at the arb but i've been out and about on my travels and this is this just incredible parrot feather headdress that i uh talked to the curator uh here anita hurley about 
and you put the the and there's a whole story I mean I would recommend the listen although it's my podcast but she talks so amazingly about how this headdress was used uh, in 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 to, to to make connections spiritual connections but also the story of how those feathers became golden bright golden orange is quite something else so in other words there's a there's a personal transformative experience for some of them other ones I put into a little political bucket I don't know if we can find one of them but somewhere I do have a Brexit coin there were a few commemorative coins I don't think that's a Brexit one down there on the bottom right but um, there were a few coins and that suggested that political process and it reminded me of the the ways in which we have to kind of muddle along societally in groups and and how political movements can radically change things and then the last category was 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 the uh, the camera and the, the 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 creative transformations which was another category but maybe i don't want to necessarily invite you to respond to that specifically but it was more of an observation around the fact that um certainly we found that we were we were thinking about objects in different types of transformations in themselves as opposed to maybe necessarily making the the connections um across them um but um there was something oh, i've forgotten there was one last thing that i was going to ask you before i opened but just up. responding to that yes briefly, please do uh, yeah I, I promise it will be brief um <laughs> i think that I think that the categories that you have chosen are really interesting and are not at all the categories that I might have chosen. And that speaks to the power of interaction in a space where the objects are not labeled or where the objects are not definitively placed in one uh, particular configuration. And or explained in one particular way, maybe. Right. And, and to me, the the bottle of wine is I included a bottle of wine as well in the very first library that I created, which was in a deconsecrated church that had even before that been a temple to Jupiter in the Abruzzo region of Italy. To me, the bottle of wine was there for the fact that it that the process of of, uh, of 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 working with bacteria toward the fermentation and preservation of grapes seemed to me to be transformative. But I absolutely agree with you that there is an internal transformation that takes place every time that we take a sip of wine. I would argue that that is also the case, though, in the hand axe. When you look at how the mind works, as somebody works out a hand axe in terms of stone napping, it is also, I believe, a process that is extremely transformative in terms of of where the mind goes and also how the mind is transformed over time through the process of making many hand axes. And I haven't done so myself, but I can say that even watching on YouTube, watching somebody nap a hand axe, I think that it changes the way in which I think. So I think that we need to be open to the fact that each of these objects is transformative on these different levels and that these different levels of transformation actually are deeply entangled. And also that the categories that we choose are informative. The taxonomy is essential to be able to make meaning in the first place, but it's contingent. And there are other meanings that might be made by others. And it's the ability to remain open to other possible meanings without simply saying that it could mean anything and therefore not thinking about any of those meanings at all. That to me is really the power of what can happen in the Library of the Great Silence. 
Well, that is that is a great place, maybe, in which to to open it up to some 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 uh, questions and conversations from others. And I know that uh, I think Denise said at the outset she had a, an object to offer. I'll just close my own um, thoughts on some of the conversations I've had, which ties in, I think, with what you were saying. I think the the overall feeling, no matter where our conversation went, it really was a great opportunity in 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 thinking about objects and thinking about transformation and thinking also about you know, this existential crisis that we, we, we are in, I don't think there's two way, any two ways about it. And the thing that came out of almost all of them was a sense of wonder and a sense of reconnection or the desire to reconnect with the world around us and the, the amazing side of things and, and to redouble our efforts. And so actually the talking about it and the using these objects as catalysts for change, well, maybe we as individuals can only do so much, but it certainly reinvigorated our desire to, to do what we can and to, to appreciate everything um, that's around us. And that was a, that's, I think, has been a recurring theme. So thank you for uh, allowing us to have this library in Cambridge. And it's been a fantastic um, project to work on. And uh, it's been great, as always, to be uh, talking with you and Judith over the last few months to make this happen.